to the men and women of Diamond Offshore, safety isn't just some set of rules. It's a skill. It's an education. It's about being better today than we were yesterday. It's learning how to protect what matters most. That's what safety means to us. At Diamond Offshore, we don't just care about safety. We teach it. We learn it. We improve on it. To be the best offshore drilling company in the world, we must be more than just drillers, mechanics, and roustabouts. We must also be protectors. We must protect our people, protect our environment, and protect our equipment. To do that, we must master the techniques of safety. And we can do that if we have the best goal, the best training, and the best people. Diamond Offshore has it all. By any measure, oil field work is one of America's most dangerous professions. The risks are unavoidable. Workers are on a shift for an average of 12-hour days dealing with highly combustible materials on a platform where cranes swing heavy equipment constantly overhead. Sometimes, all of this isolated hundreds of miles off coast. With seven to 14 days on a rig at a time, it can be a lonely experience. If something goes wrong, the Coast Guard responds, though even in the best case scenario, help is not close. In the meantime, the crew uses watertight life pods that can hold up to 10 people and that lower down into the water in the event of an emergency. There they wait for help to arrive. Such conditions can lead to rare but catastrophic incidents like the explosion that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico some 50 miles off the coast of Louisiana aboard Trans Ocean's Deepwater Horizon oil rig. 115 people made it to safety and several workers died. The mandatory hard hats and steel-toed boots aren't just for looks. Over the last several years, hundreds of people were killed in the oil and gas industry, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Safety in the oil and gas industry is a concern both on and offshore. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which oversees working conditions in refineries on land, has issued multi-million dollar fines to major oil companies. OSHA is very concerned that the oil industry is not making the investment needed to run these refineries safely and workers are paying for it with their lives. In this insider exclusive investigative network TV special, our news team goes on location in dangerous oil field work, Alfred Francois's story, to examine how Ob Ward, partner at Naquin and Ward, successfully won a major verdict for his client Alfred Francois. Ob will also explain the protections workers are entitled to working on these dangerous rigs under maritime law. Maritime law recognizes those who work on the water such as seamen, dredge workers, captains and crew members frequently work in dangerous conditions. Depending on how a seaman was injured, general maritime law, the Jones Act and unseaworthiness dictate his or her entitlement to compensation. Each of these particular maritime claims has unique and specific requirements in order to obtain compensation from ship owners and operators. Probably the most familiar type of compensation which injured seamen are entitled to is maintenance and cure. Maintenance is compensation for room and board while recuperating from injuries. Cure covers medical care and treatment. Frequently, insurance companies attempt to prematurely end these maintenance and cure payments. The Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act provides protection for those maritime workers such as longshore and harbor workers, crane operators, bridge builders, and other people who work in marinas who may not otherwise be covered under the provisions of maritime law. The Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act is a federal workers' compensation statute which frequently compensates injured workers at a higher rate than state workers' compensation laws. Ob Ward has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in Baton Rouge, in Louisiana, and in the nation, fighting for equal justice for all Americans. He has earned a reputation as an unyielding country lawyer who repeatedly represents individuals and families against large corporations and repeatedly wins. Ob has built a substantial reputation nationwide by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down and his amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Baton Rouge, Louisiana.
It is my great pleasure to introduce Ob Ward to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tell our audience a little bit about what type of law you practice. I practice primarily now maritime law, offshore Louisiana oil field work and Mississippi uh, vessel. Representing individuals primarily. I always represent the individuals. I've never represented a, a company. Um, you, as any lawyer, you could practice, you could represent major corporations, you could represent, you know, a lot of business interests, but why do you choose to represent the individual? Well, I grew up relatively uh, poor in North Louisiana. My father was a hard-working man. I worked uh, my way through school. As a result, I worked construction jobs, oil field jobs, maritime jobs, and I just felt a kinship to those people who do that for a living. So you've actually been there and done that? Yes. I have. It's dangerous work, isn't it? Yes, it is. Today we have a case, which is a maritime case, Correct. and that's the reason we came to Baton Rouge to actually film this, where you have a client, Alfred Francois. That's correct. Um, who is the salt of the earth kind of guy. Tell our audience who he is. Well, uh, he is what we call in South Louisiana a pure Cajun. He's an uneducated but intelligent man who basically had to give up education to raise his brothers. He had 15 brothers and sisters um, at the age of, I think, third grade. So he had to make the choice, and so he went into the oil field and has been working in the oil field his whole life. And what happened in this case? Why did he become your client? Well, that's interesting. Alfred called me, right, and, and I went to see him. He lives about two hours from here up in central Louisiana, and he told me his story. He told me his story was that they say this accident was my fault because I went to a safety meeting where they talked about this, what was going to happen, and I wasn't at that safety meeting. Mm -hmm. I said, that didn't make any sense. Right. He showed me the piece of paper that was a sign-in piece of paper for the safety meeting. I looked at it and I said, well, Alfred, there's your name. He says, I didn't sign that. And I, I've heard every story in the book in my business. But he said it, and I looked at him, and at that moment, I made the decision that if this man is telling the truth, I'm going to help him out. Yeah. And I went back to his, see him four more times. He came down to see me two more times before I was satisfied that, what he was, that his story was true. But as they tell, always say, if you tell the truth, you never have to remember what happened. He told his story to me at least six times, and he never changed a word. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. The, the company that he worked for at that time was Diamond Offshore. Diamond Offshore. Okay. It's a big company. Worldwide drilling corporation. Okay. And he had worked for that company, what, 34 years? 38 years. I had that wrong. Years. 38 years. Okay. What was his story? and what was their story, and what did they present? What did Diamond Offshore present, and I'm, I think I'm safe to say this, as fabricated evidence to dispute what he was saying? Well, it's twofold. Uh, what we found was that they, their investigation didn't seem to hold water as right. to what happened. Um, initially, they presented him with this piece of paper in which they say, we had the safety meeting, you were there, you should have been more careful. They showed it to him after the fact yeah. and said, but Alfred, he says, I wasn't at the meeting. They said, well, no, you were at the meeting, here's your, here's your signature. Yeah. And that's when he, the issue of contested signature came up. Right. I've been doing this business for 35 years. I have never had to hire a handwriting expert ever in my practice. I don't do criminal work, so I mean, in the civil practice, I've never had to hire that. Right. In this case, I had to hire a handwriting expert. Right. And then that came out at the trial. Mm -hmm. They had a handwriting expert, we had a handwriting expert. Mm -hmm. I, th I think our gentleman was much more convincing, much more uh, real as mm -hmm. to what happened. In conjunction with the safety meeting, they say he did not. They say he attended, he said he did not. Mm -hmm was another meeting the night before in which they talked in the captain's quarters about this incident. What had happened is a piece of grating, which is part of the deck work of these boats, had fallen in in rough weather the night before. Right. Everybody knew about it. The job is when you know about it, you do something to put everybody on notice that this is a dangerous situation, bad weather, we can't fix it now, we'll fix it later. Mm -hmm. 
They said they had a meeting in captain's quarters the night before, and they said Alfred was at that meeting. Alfred told me I wasn't there. At the trial, we called the witnesses. Conveniently, there were no witnesses still working for Diamond Offshore mm -hmm. that were supposed to be at that meeting. They weren't at the trial. So I pointed it out to the jury that, isn't it funny that everybody who's testifying here today that could support the company's position. That can support the company's position. And they look good for the company, right? Well, they're still in the employ of the company. Yeah. Were they still employed with the company? Yes. Yeah, they were. Nobody testified in right. this case for Diamond yeah. that was not an employee. Of Excellent the point. Excellent point. So basically, you disproved their whole story. It appears that way. Yeah. Yes. Now, you know, the question, you know, you got to ask is you've got a pretty substantial verdict here, correct? Yes, we did. Yeah. And the question you have to ask is why did Diamond Offshore, big company, multi-billion dollar company, why did they go to the extent that they did to an individual who had worked for them, been loyal for 38 years? Why did they try and not be responsible, be accountable for his injuries? Your guess is as good as mine. I asked myself that many times in this case of yeah. all cases. Yeah. I don't think I've yeah. ever experienced yeah. a more loyal employee. Yeah. Keep in mind, Alfred was hurt yeah. once before with Diamond, right. missed a year of work, right. went back to work immediately after the doctor released him, yeah. never sued them, never made a claim. Yeah. He's as loyal an employee as you could ask for. Today we have with us one of the experts you used in your case, Stephanie Chalfin. So let's bring her on right now. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. Thank you. Exactly what did you contribute to this case? I assessed Mr. Francois's vocational potential, mm -hmm. what type of work can he or can he not do because of the injury to his knee. Um, he had worked for the same company for 29 years as a crane operator, but the important factor was that he was a functional illiterate and really had never done any other type of work, which was very vital in terms of his employability. Mm -hmm. So I discussed those type of issues within my report and my testimony. And this is important in a case because since he can no longer be a crane operator, they have to look at other type of work that he could possibly do and it's virtually almost nil, right? As a practical matter, it is nil. So that figures in the overall uh, verdict award, that's the potential verdict award, correct? Well, what happened in this case was the testimony was that yes, there are jobs out there yeah. that he is physically capable but of. But nothing comparable to what he was making before. Well, no, nothing really available. Yeah. No one's really going to hire him. Yeah. That's what it really came down to. Right. That even though he was a very hard working gentleman, the skills that he had acquired were not applicable to the labor market given the limitations he had now mm -hmm. because of his injuries which were compounded by his illiteracy. Mm -hmm. It's a, a unique situation, isn't it? You don't find too many people that are lacking in literacy skills because then what, what can they do, right? That's right. In fact, I'd venture to say that probably uh, today if you were hired as a crane operator, they'd probably have you take some sort of exam, right? Well, I don't think he could get in the job exactly. in the market today. Exactly. Well, as a crane operator, he did have to take tests, mm -hmm. but they were given to him orally. Right. Because he was such a good employee, they made that accommodation for him. Mm -hmm. But for most of your employees, they wouldn't be doing that. Right. And you are a re rehabilitation counselor also, right? Um, a rehabilitation counselor and a life care planner. A life care planner. What is a life care planner, by the way? Well, let's say, for example, we can use you. Mm -hmm. You were in a catastrophic accident and you sustained a traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. where you were not able to do the type of work you're doing mm -hmm. and you would require long-term medical care and a life care plan outlines 
the type of care you would need throughout your life, as well as the cost. Right. I've seen some of these life care plans, and they are always disputed by both sides. Very much so. Does the jury decide? They decide all these facts, don't they? They decide them all. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Stephanie, for being on the show and sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Fortunately, we have Alfred and Linda with us today, so let's bring them on. It is my great pleasure to introduce Alfred and Linda to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being there. So, you had this horrible accident that happened to you, and you worked for this company uh, 38 years, right? 38, yes. I'm an offshore, right? Yes. Well, I worked with Diamond, but I originally come on Odico. Okay. Odigo worked for 20 something years with Odigo, then they merged with Diamond. Yeah. That's how I worked with Diamond. Yeah, and you were a crane operator. Yes, sir. So you were the one that was lifting all this equipment. It's yeah, a pretty dangerous job, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, you had been injured before on the job, hadn't you? Before this accident, a couple of times before? One time. Right. I got hurt. And you went back to work right after that. Right back, you? I went right, right. back. So you, you, you felt a, a, a family relationship with Diamond Offshore, didn't you? Well, was, I spent more time with them than I did with my family. Yeah. So when you got injured and then all of a sudden you discovered that they were saying things that were totally untrue, what were your thoughts? Well, I really lost faith in them. Yeah. You know, the way they were going to treat me. Uh -huh. uh, just the way I felt, they were just going to throw me to the dog. Uh -huh. But it didn't work. Right. Because of your lawyer and what you were able to prove, correct? Yes, sir. What was your feeling, Linda, when you saw all this happen to the, you know, your husband of how long? 35, 35. years? Yeah. What, what they were doing to your husband. What did you feel? Well... You know, when we first got married years ago, he worked offshore. Yeah. And he always had this saying of telling me, Linda, if something happens to me offshore and they call you, don't call the doctor, don't call nobody, call me a lawyer. <laughs> but when this happened, it had done happened years before and yeah. I was with him. Yeah. No, he said, they're going to treat me right. But toward the end, I was kind of getting a little itchy and me and Alfred talked. I said, let's talk to a lawyer. Let's get one on standby. Yeah. And we got a hold to Mr. Hobb and he was on standby and within two weeks we were called and they yeah. said they were finished. Because originally Ob said that when he heard your story it was kind of an unusual story. Almost hard to believe, correct? Yes. That here was a big corporation, multi-billion dollar corporation showing that yeah, you had attended a meeting. Here was your signature, but that wasn't your signature, was it? Couldn't sign nothing if I wasn't there. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I wasn't there. Yeah. Are you, do you still have friends with Diamond Offshore that are working there? I got a lot of friends, a lot. Yeah. It's not, it's not the working people that hurt me. Yeah. It's the people in the office. Right. It's the management. Yeah, the manager. I mean, for the people, I meet them every day. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. They call me, they talk to mm -hmm. me, you know, do what I had to do. You're in retirement kind of right now, right? Yes, sir. What do you do most of the time? Cook and drink beer. Yeah. I've already asked you what beer you drank. <laughs> what was your answer? My kind and your kind. <laughs> Two kinds of beer. Well, listen, I thank you very much, both of you, for being on the show, and we wish you a long life together. mentioned the Jones Act, which is the act that governs uh, seamen, right? That's working correct. in offshore oil fields, working on vessels. What is the Jones Act? Well, it's a historical uh, legislation passed back in the 1800s to protect seamen. Yeah. Seamen is a term of art. Those are the people who work on the boats, the deckhands, the captains, the mates, those people. It's to give them extra protections under the law because they feel that those people, because they expose themselves to the hazards of the sea, are entitled to great protection. Right. Who is responsible under the Jones Act? The employer 
is responsible under the Jones Act, as well as co-employees. And one last question. How do you choose your clients and your cases? You have a lot of people contact you. What criteria do you use? Primarily, uh, it has to be someone I'm going to care about. Uh, the, generally, the injuries have to be substantial because these cases are expensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, but generally, I try to develop a rapport with my clients uh, so that I care about them because I can't go into a courtroom and expect a jury to care about them if I don't care about them. Right. You've got to put yourself in their shoes. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us and for taking care of the guys that need, the men and the women, that need your kind of assistance. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.